What's happening, everyone? Welcome to the Sportscaster. It's me, Andy Grant. We've got Gary Judge from across the park, and we are taking you through this past week of sport. Um, sorry, it's on the old stream yard. I'm actually down in Cornwall for a little week away. Uh, and I know, Gary, you had an interesting uh, fun weekend in Benicassim as well. So um, next week, we should be back in the studio. But for now, we make do with this. Um, let's start off with Wimbledon. Again, I think last week we started off with Wimbledon. And um, since it's come to a conclusion, it's probably a good um, a good spot to start there. I'll, I'll kick it off, mate. I was devastated. That, uh, yeah, and I will. Uh, you know what? I'm going to get the negativity out of the way straight away. It done me head in. I'm in a couple of group chats and I've seen a little bit on social media. That the first thing people were commenting on after watching that epic final was vaccines. Oh, no, uh, no, back. Uh, the anti backs of this and that. Shut up, man. Just yeah. watch that final and just what appreciate it. Yeah. Just appreciate the performance from both of them. A little bit of yeah. felt like a changing of the guard, you know, old versus new. And yeah. just tennis players playing out of the skin. Could have went one way or the or the other. I was looking at the in play live betting. You know, at one point Djokovic was five to one. Next minute he was really? one. I mean, that just shows you how topsy turvy the match was. An incredible performance um, from both men, and um, yeah, just just absolutely unbelievable. I don't know whether you got to got to watch it yourself, but I did. I watched the whole thing. Yeah, obviously, I was in Spain, and it was a massive massive occasion with the Spanish, wasn't it? Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I watched the whole thing. I watched the first bit on like a on a phone in this bar we were in, and then we ended up just going back to the um, to our apartment to watch the last last set, and um, just like streamed it onto the telly. But yeah, what what a match! And, and like right up until I'm not messing, right up until the last point, I felt as though Djokovic was still gonna pull it back, even when he had the you know championship points. I thought no, mm. he's gonna pull this back and still ends up you know breaking him and, and whatever. It was just, it was an incredible match. I mean, to to lose the first set of a final in the manner that he did, and to come back and win it against a player like I mean, he was he was Djokovic had two set points in that second set. On in fact, one set point it was six five, wasn't it in the tiebreak? Djokovic had a set point to go two nil up in the final of Wimbledon, where he's been so imperious for the last ten years for Alcaraz at that age to come back and and beat him. In, in the fashion that he did and it was just it was amazing to watch but as you say he just he went toe to toe didn't he throughout it was a long game I think uh, Djokovic 25 minutes for the game 25 minutes the service game like and that felt like a massive mental kind of victory that then so I think it was Alcaraz who went to win. Uh, no Djokovic Djokovic won that one he held, was, it. He held a server I remember thinking like this is whoever gets this it's just going to be like a massive massive boost I watched it. There was, there was there was so many games. Sorry, there's so many games that Djokovic won, and I thought that's it. Now he's going to go on and, and win it. There was the point that I think lost it for me. Djokovic was in the fifth set, and he just held the serve, and he had a, ch a chance to break out. Because I think it was only two one. He could have went three one up, and uh, he, he somehow goes to win it and ends up in the net, yeah. and then he loses the next serve, and you think, wow, that's you know, if if that if he gets that that shot in. He, he it was a volley, pretty... wasn't it? Yeah. There was a volley, wasn't it? Like, uh, he was trying to pass him with this volley and hit the net with it. And it, it looked so kind of, so it's bread and butter and he somehow misses it. Yeah. And Alcaraz um, ends up holding save and then Alcaraz both in the next one and it was just like, wow, that was a big moment. Uh, yeah. And I thought, you know, really humble in his in his um, his, his speech as well. He um, got a little bit teary when talking to his kids. Mm -hmm. And again, that's what frustrated me even more, you know, I actually went, I actually got a little bit wound up by seeing a few of the comments of people just having a, having a go at Novak. And people seem to think, or people with short memories at least, that Novak's, you know, arrogance, he's ignorant, he's maybe give stick to the ball boys, he's done this, he's done that. You only have to Google or YouTube Roger Federer. He's had a right few spats with some umpires over the time, do you know what I mean? And people seem to think yeah. that Novak's this kind of arrogant, cocky, uh, you know, Non, uh, non anti vaxxer kind of and put him on this pedestal. I just think it's so unfair. I don't think he's yeah. odd. He sometimes plays up to it a little bit with holding his ear and looking at the crowd and things like that. But it got me thinking that you know, there's there's so many sportsmen who who are you know the goats of their particular field who are exactly like that. You know, you look at Rodney, yeah. um, you know, Mike Tyson, Michael Jordan, the basketball player, 
You know, all these people, they are a bit arrogant. They have got something about them. They have got that kind of thing in them to be angry or to be a bit. But yeah, Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods, yeah. But I think, I don't know whether it's because there was three of them at the same time or people could almost pick whether he wants to go Roger and Rafa or Novak and people have just kind of last pick was Novak. But I think if Novak's like that on his own, Again, you look at every great sportsman. Sorry, yeah. Can't feel myself really defending no back all the time. Not that he needs me to, but it was um, it was good. Him get people at the same time. Just as a massive fan of tennis, it was great to see a young, know, young twenty year old come. I mean, that was the first time in twenty two years that either Murray or the Big Three haven't actually won Wimbledon. So it just showed where the doc that's been had. So it was great to see a young uh, twenty year old Carlos. Who I think we're going to see a lot from. Over the next kind of 10 to 15 years. Yeah, and do you be a preview in the match briefly with me last week? And I was saying, I, I just couldn't see, couldn't see Alcaraz winning it, getting given out the manner in which he was beaten in the French by, um, by Djokovic. And yeah, I really couldn't, really couldn't see it happening. But no, what, what a match and deserve his winning in the end. Yeah, there was actually two, um, so the both finals on the Saturday, the women's, and then obviously on the Sunday, the two underdogs won. Would have been a tasty little bet. I think he would have got like three to one and two to one, I think, for them. Um, and then also a bit closer to home, you had uh, Neil Scubsey. I think that's how you say his name, Scubsey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ken, sir. He's from Liverpool. He won that. So he's won Wimbledon twice in the mixed doubles, but he won it actually in the men's doubles. Um, I think it's the first time in a Brit has won Wimbledon for however long. Um, that was great for him, obviously being a scouser as well. Then you also had a young, um, let me get his name right, not young, Seth. yeah, the um, yeah, Neil, what was his name? Seal, I think his name was, yeah, it... he won the uh, the, 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 the juniors, 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 yeah. So, um, let's hope he has he was, a bit he, more. He as well, by the way, yeah, he's on seniors, he he the the yeah. as well. so he's on yeah. great school. There was a little bit of joy in the British, um, kind of side of things, uh. As again, we seem to just knock British tennis for a while because of our Emma, but thankfully there was some hope there in the doubles and uh, and and then the youth coming through. But yeah, I'm good to this over. Really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, on to, on to the next big Grand Slam now. Um, may to go on to what you want to go on to next? Um, we can talk here. Yeah, go on, let's go for it. Yeah, we've had fucking so long last time, didn't we? Yeah, there was a, uh, just a few ones that have come up straight away, and this is definitely maybe one for our Wednesday shows that are going to be coming up, and we can talk about the kind of impact on society this has, but uh, just breaking now, Ryan Giggs' retrial has been abandoned after domestic violence charges have been withdrawn. This comes on the back of, obviously, Mason Greenwood's um, accuser dropping air charges. It comes on the back of uh, Mendy, Man City's left-back, um, face it and getting a non-guilty verdict yeah. uh, again you know, it's impossible to speculate on all the reasons you know what's gone on around this but it is just a worrying thing and and again there's so many different aspects to this but with the case of gigs and greenwood it's the, the the kind of people who have been abused initially saying oh, i'm not doing it no more apparently gears yeah. is one he'd come out and said the first trial took too much out of me and i don't want to go through it again so now Gr- gigs is kind of walking away from it Whereas on the other hand, you've got Mendy who actually has gone through it, went to trial and has got... Been in jail. Been in jail. Yeah, been in jail. And he come out and now he's got non-guilty. Or guilty. So, I just think this... I don't even want to think of it it's, because it's, obviously it's... you've got... You've got... Sorry. It, it's how it's been handled publicly, isn't it? It's been it's been in the media and throughout the whole time that they've been under accusation. And as you were alluding to there, that... The fact that the victims are, are, are suggesting that all of that, all the trials and tribulations of being followed by the press for for you know this amount of time, being put under that scrutiny, being asked constantly about about it, that's what they're saying. One of the reasons they're saying why they've they've either withdrew the charges or they don't want to go through it again. It's it's sad, and it, yeah, it's, you know it's really sad. And then you've got the other side of things where maybe um, footballers themselves. Are actually getting, you know, altered. Yeah, targeted maybe by by people because you know, obviously, there's a, there's a big payday in there. You know, let's let's just 
be be honest, you know, really? so that are out there who want to try and bring people down and, and do what they can and stuff. And you look at Mendy, if you just look at it in the court of the law, he's innocent. He's mm -hmm. lost two years of his professional life. I know there's a few footballers come out and have, have kind of backed him up and said, you know, we're here for you, Pogba being one of them. Um, I listen, if you, again, I've probably, probably not on my own, but I've probably had judgments on Mendy given what I've seen in the media. And, you know, you look yeah. at these millionaires and think that they are, they can do what they want and you you prejudge them. But in the cause of the Lord, he's innocent. And now he's got to try and rebuild his, his career, re rebuild his name. And you wonder, you know, we play, he was playing for Man City. They just won the, the treble. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. What What does he do with his career now? It is it. It's it's a really, it's a really strange one. But but, but I think if um, look if you were to make it really simple, if he, if he was to go back and put himself in the same position and and the you know the the vulnerability he put himself or the vulnerable position he put him himself in and the women he, the women he was with in mm -hmm. wouldn't do it again, would he? Do you know what I mean? And I, he's you know he said look that that. I enjoyed doing that. You know that it was parties. What you know that was my thing or whatever. But it didn't go any further than that. If you ask him now, would you still go and have them parties? He wouldn't. And and the advice that you'd give to people like that, unfortunately, in that position, is you are going to be subjected either people targeting you, or you're gonna there's going to be you know um, times when you you're putting yourself in a, an unnecessarily mm. risky position. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, it, and so, it's sad, you know, it's sad that he can't go and just have a nice time and party with his mates without being in that risky position. But the fact is, but you, he's getting paid 200 grand a week and that's it. He should, should know better. That's, that's, that's just it. Well, not, not, I don't necessarily think you should know better. I just think it's like you're making a decision, aren't you? You either choose that life or you choose the other life, you know, if you're going to be a professional elite athlete. And I'm not saying you can't you can't have sex if you're an elite I, athlete, I, I, but... I'll be honest, mate. If I was earning that type of money, I I would, I yeah. And, and again, go down and, 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 and what the what's the, one, the George Best kind of route? You know, I, I think I would be kind of one of them waking up with with a hangover and Miss World lying in my bed. And I would, yeah. I'd find it really difficult to to have the professionalism as a, a, like a I don't know a bloody line or messy maybe or something. But yeah, that's why I'm doing. No, it is. But, but again, no, I'm. I've seen it. <laughs> I'm fairly sure again. No, if you if if he was asked that question, or would you do it again? Would you? He'd probably say no. I'd probably try and, you know, try and avoid that. Or at least if I was going to do it, it'd be the exception, not the rule. Every you know, every weekend there was yeah. consistency. You know, the more times you have done it, the more chance there was going to be someone he attracted and yeah. who was going to try and exploit that. Yeah. Um, but do we stick with Man City for a minute? I seen a uh, Gundogan has gone to Barca. Um, yeah, and I've kind of spoken about it for a while, but it just seems mad to me that you know Liverpool and Man City, you know, both been you know take up take last season away, but I know Man City did dominate last season. But the last four or five years, you've had Liverpool, Man City, oh, toe to toe, Henderson and Gundogan being the um, being the captains, and they both now well Gundogan's left. We'll come on to Henderson in a bit, but you know he's just won this treble with Man City, and he and he's leaving for Barcelona. You think? No, but uh, that. What what else has he got to achieve? And I, Barca will always be that club, whether we like it or not. The the players are wrong. Well, yeah. I, I want to play at Barca. Do you know what I mean? And um, even as a scout, nothing sir, else. For him, really. cool. if I, I would still get you know all the way to Barca. I would. Yeah, and I, and it's what else is there for him to achieve at City? You know, he, he has done everything. You no, know, and and Pep and slash you know City have had almost had that. Um, they almost come become notorious for going on. Okay, we'll, we'll play. We, we were saying it when we a few years ago. Why is Aguero leaving? Why do you let Aguero leave? He's still he's still banging them in. He, he just seems yeah. to he just seems to know when it's time for the players to move on. Vice versa, the player players almost seems to have that mutual kind of understanding. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's it's the you know the change of the guards here. I'm leaving. Someone else is going to come in and take my place. I'll still go and achieve something. But they invariably seem to get it right. And I think mm -hmm. in the case of of Gunza and and maybe City, it's probably a good move for everyone. Um, I don't know. I mean, look, if I was a City fan, I'd be devastated losing Gunza when he's just had by far and away his best season for them, hasn't he? Yeah. You know the the, the goals he scored, the time, and other goals towards the end. Goals, the season, really got, goals. Yeah. His his overall influence was was getting was getting bigger, wasn't it? Almost game yeah. by game. But um, 
Yeah, and and it you know it's still it's still a mad situation for Bars, isn't it? They, that that deal would would have been done probably six weeks ago almost, or certainly straight after the Champions League final, as it not been for all of the FFP stuff that they're trying to kind of duck and dive through. And the fact that at the moment that the new camp's getting you know redeveloped slash knocked down and they're building a new stadium, which is going to cost like whatever five billion, yeah, and yet they can't afford to pay. You know the wages of some of the players is just. Yeah, and I'm actually going to Spain uh, at the end of the month, and I was hoping to take me little girl to the new camp, but I don't actually know what kind of state. No, you in. can't. It's just getting it's getting completely demolished. Really? Yeah. 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 Wow. So yeah, it's getting completely demolished. I've been telling me to been telling me little girl all week. We're going to go to the new camp. So actually, <laughs> my plan. Let's put your hard hat, mate. Hard hat, trying <laughs> and get a high vis vest on you, mate. You might struggle. Maybe we'll we'll finish off on Man City with a positive note to seeing Jack Grealish has just donated five grand to students from Birmingham who was given weeks oh. to live. So, you know, there's a lot of bad press on footballers, but let's not forget, you know, they do do a lot of good stuff as well that we probably don't hear about, which so it was nice for him. <clears throat> um, do you know what? That, that probably happens every day, doesn't it? Yeah. It's good, it's good for a change the media to picking it up and actually, you know, he doesn't. He's not looking for acknowledgement there, is he? You know, it wasn't. No, exactly. He's been on his own social media. You know, he... he Made it, made the donation, and you know, we're just kind of get on with things, but no, it's class stuff. Maybe we'll move on to Liverpool then. Um, where to even start with Jordan Henderson? I think you know, we don't think it, the news had broke at it last week about Henderson. No, you know, I think everyone else has been linked to a move to Saudi apart from him. And then, as soon as we stop recording, Jordan Henderson gets linked. <clears throat> I think he's for me, I'd be already on the plane. I mean. I think, I think I tweeted about it. In the 2013-14 season, he played 35 games. He missed out on the last three games because of a booking. And sorry, he's sending off. And arguably, you know, people said if he was playing in that Chelsea game when Gerrard slipped, you know, it could have been a different game because Henderson that season was unbelievable. The next season, he has the task then of kind of taking over from Gerrard in that position and then also being captain when Gerrard eventually leaves. Mm-hmm. Goes on, wins absolutely everything as Liverpool captain. Gets and he's still, by the way, he's still berated and slagged by some sections of the supporters. Then he gets a chance in his in his as thirty three years of age to go over to the Middle East and earn seven hundred grand a week, and he's still somehow getting knocked and slagged. And I'm just like, what can this fella do for a break? Do you know what I mean? He's he's done everything we've ever asked for. He's given twelve years of his life. He's gonna go and earn himself a lot of money, and people are still having a pop at him. It's like. Yeah. No, uh, I, I don't get it. It's really, uh, really scary for him because he's actually now in a point where he could actually even not go. He could actually not go to Saudi and still get kind of slagged off because he's even been like spoken about. Or see, yeah. um, seeing the LGBTQ um, coming out saying Gerard ne- uh, Henderson needs to explain himself. Henderson doesn't need to explain himself to anyone. You know what I mean? If he wants to go and, and send it, 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 yeah. It, no, no, but it is it is ironic, like isn't he? You know, he, he, he can't he can't um he can't complain about them coming out when he, he was the one who you know, he was he was uh slagging the Saudis and stuff for the way he treated. Yeah, but um, the, the point to that is though, right? <clears throat> so he's Liverpool captain, right? He's playing for England and then someone says to him, you know, what are your thoughts on on, on gay release? How do you read it? You'll dive on a little shout yeah, out to yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So as Liverpool captain, as one of the kind of senior pros, Jordan Henderson gets asked about LGBTQ. So he has to answer it. And he obviously is a decent human and says, Well, yeah, you know, you know, gay people should have the same rights as everyone else. Mm. So he can either do that, which he come out and says, or he can stay silent on it. And then people would have a go at him for being silent. So he's done the right thing and come out and say, Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. But then years later. You know, he gets this opportunity, so it's like he's almost shot. No, I get by being a like, layer. Yeah. It's like yeah, yeah. what he can do. You know, it's... no, I, it'd be the equivalent, be the equivalent to one of us getting asked about something that, as an out, some CEO has said about a particular subject, and you went, "No, I don't really agree with that. That's not right." But then that CEO coming to you a couple of years later and going, "Andy, I want to offer you ten million pounds a year to come and work for us." You wouldn't say, "I don't, I don't agree with the opinion, mate," so I can't come. Yeah, it's it's not. He's not asking you to come and be an ambassador for 
the you know <laughs> The, 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 opinions on stuff. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's just saying I want you to come and play fuzzy for us that, or in, in our league. You know, I actually had a little bit of a back and forth with someone on Twitter. I said to him, you know, you're you're putting this fella who, who was paid to kick a ball around a piece of grass on such a such a pedestal. Do you know what I mean? He, at the end of the day, it's a fella who's getting paid to go and play a game of fuzzy in a different country, and you're yeah. putting on this. You should not do this. Your opinions are that fuck off. I, I don't I don't get it at all. Do you know what I mean? And anyway, well, it looks to the point. You, you, you just, you just want, you just want them to pay for you to come over, don't you? And, and have a few weeks in Saudi and have a nice holiday. Do a little pep talk with the boys in Saudi. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, but I do feel a bit sorry for him in the sense that if this move doesn't materialise, he's already been kind of tarred with this Saudi brush, mm. and he might not get the Saudi money, which I think would be a bit unfortunate for him. Um, he, but... it, just a question for you then, as a red, does if it, this doesn't come off now? I'm not saying does he have to leave because you're not going to say, oh, you're not welcome now, Joe, because he, he's, he's done a lot for you, obviously, as a club. But does, do you think that kind of is his position not untenable, but does he need to leave then, really? Is it to Which, probably say to him, oh, club are going to let me go? Don't really feel like sticking around now. I mean, it's not the first time that people have tried, not tried to sell, but have welcomed offers for Henderson, though, is it? It's a, great, it's a great question, Gary. I think it's a great question. I think. <clears throat> The thing is, moving him on may be one thing, but I definitely think he can't be captain no more. You know, I think just the way the media works, it's already, you know, become quite apparent that a personal, you know, terms were already fixed. 700 grand a week, done yeah. deal. It was just about the two clubs coming to an agreement. Now, if for whatever reason the clubs don't come to an agreement, I don't know how Henderson can go back in that dressing room and say, I was willing to jump ship, go and earn 700 grand a week, but that deal never mm-hmm. come through, but I'm still your captain. Yeah, I don't yeah. know how we can do that, so... I'm not saying I'd be in a rush to kind of, you know, you know, cars him off somewhere else if he doesn't go to Saudi. But I definitely think his position as a Liverpool captain and leader has definitely come under question now. And that, that's not his own doing. That's just maybe the media who've kind of ran with it and, and told everyone about this move. So that's why I feel a bit sorry for him. You know, if he doesn't get this big paycheck, he's kind of, you know, he's got the all the gazing on his yeah. back. <laughs> Take that out you know, how you... Don't ask me. But <laughs> And and he's potentially lost his kind of role as Liverpool captain, and he might not get his move. You know, it's a bit like he's getting chased chased down the street by loads of gay reds. I know, and, and he's and, he, and he's on the down for He's he's only he's, his four, he's only on us four million a year, not his thirty six million that he thought he'd be gonna get. So um, I hope anyway. The last thing I'm saying, I hope he does get his move, and he can you know go and try and have an impact. Because I'm sure he will try. I mean, it might fall on deaf ears, but I'm sure he will try and have a positive impact over there if he does go. Uh, as well as Fabinho, who looks like we're getting yeah. forty million for him, and it's it's a weird with Pill fans because I'm um, I'm going to be conscious of not doing a, a Gary judging and putting all the Pill fans in in my opinion, but I think most Liverpool fans will will have felt a bit positive on the likes of um, you know the two new lads coming in, and you're thinking you know what our midfield's looking a bit more packed, and then within a few days we're losing two again, so we're back in the same position of needing to then. Yeah, more players. You're not. You know what I mean? Let, let, let's be honest. I'm not going to talk for Liverpool fans. I'm going to talk in general for footy fans. Most footy fans have watched Fabinho over the last six months to a year and went, what has happened to you? Yeah. He yeah. looks like he's been throwing a, car- throwing a caravan around for, for like the last six months. And whether it was he was still a bit of a hangover from, I don't know, an injury or whatever it was, but he, he literally just fell off a cliff. And so yeah. I think if you can get 40 million for him, Oh, it's massive. Uh, how old is he? How old is he? Must be coming up to his But you know the thing yeah, is, yeah. we paid 40 mil for him. He's won absolutely mm-hmm. ever. I'm not getting 40 mil for him. It's madness. So yeah. it's not so much that I, I'm, I'm gutted to see him. Well, I'm gutted. It's sad to see what you know, one a great player who's whenever it goes. It'd be sad in one sense. But what I mean is, at least he was a, he was a, he was a, yeah, yeah. Field. you know, we've just lost another player. And I think they need mm-hmm. to start really replacing him quickly because pre season started, etc. Um, yeah, you still you still need a bit. You still need depth and experience, yeah. and there's a, you, that's the other thing as well. You you are losing three, including Milner, very experienced players. So it's the yeah. impact on the dressing room as well as on the pitch, isn't it? And it, it's there's look like they're not going to try and go for uh, Cassiedo. Um, looks like he's out of the running. Um, so I don't know whether there's that many midfielders that have to be in your role actually out mm-hmm. and available at the moment. So it's going to be interesting to see what the pool do. Um, any news on Everton? 
this week. I've not really seen much of me being away. No, not really. It's because uh, yeah, ru- there's rumours. Uh, Andy Alanga, I think, is 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 gathering a bit of pace. Um, there was one I seen this morning as well, which was similar. Uh, Che Evans from um, from Southampton, where again it's two clubs are talking. I mean, f- from my point of view, I think. Um, both of those positions he's addressing, as I've said a few times, we need a winger, we need a forward. I think the whole Ashley Young thing has probably just filled a temporary gap or has, has meant that we might not have to spend on, a, on covering fullback in the, in the fullback position. I think if we manage to keep all of our midfielders, they'll probably leave that one alone. I think James Garner's performance in the um, in the, the under-21s has is, is probably assured Dykes that not only is he you know, is he capable of playing in midfield, but he can also cover probably in the fullback areas as well. Mm. So I think it's a striker and a winger that, that he's desperate for. Um, I think, I think again, it's fair to say, I don't think Evertonians will be jumping out of the seat with the sign of Che Evans, but he's probably the profile of the type of forward that we would expect Tykes to go for, and also the profile physically of the forward that we need to to lead the line. He, you know, he, he's, you know, he's physically um, capable of running behind, holding the ball up, He's fairly young, so you know it's not a, not a bad investment, and he, it's fair to say probably he's he's underwhelmed a little bit. There's a little bit more to come from him. Um, can I, can and, I and then, as as an Evertonian, can I ask you on the back of the Delhi Alley stuff coming out? By the way, fair play to you for coming out. I mean, yeah, yeah, that, that I think we've got to speak about that if we talk about seven, like, yeah. Um, before we go into kind of him personally, just him as a footballer, do you have any hopes on him? coming back as a bit of a new signing or is it we'll talk about the mental health stuff in a minute but just as a footballer do, do you kind of think you know what now we've now we've well, back on the this it's be... an inter- it's an interesting one isn't it so let's just talk about him as a player first and we'll come on to the personal stuff which is a, a little bit more complicated isn't it Let, let's just make the assumption now that you know he, he's he's on the right track uh, as a player and, he, and he's going to start to get back to close to what he was like close to the player that we are hoping he'd be maybe Um He's got seven games that he can play for Everton before there's a twenty million pound fee triggered where we have to pay to Tottenham. Wow! So you know that, that it's a it's a ticking clock. So <laughs> if I'm Sean Dyche, if I'm Sean Dyche, I'm thinking you're not you're not putting one foot on that pitch until you're ready, hundred percent ready, because I've then got seven games to decide whether you're worth paying twenty million for. And then the second thing, which is a huge dilemma. He's only got 12 months left on his contract. So there's absolutely no way that Sean Dykes is even letting Deli Ali step on that pitch until one, he's ready to play and make an impact, a positive impact. And two, that he's, you know, assured the club that he's going to sign a new contract if and when he, he makes his first appearance. The reason being, obviously, there's two sides with the contract's got no link, actually, because we could, we, Deli Ali could sign another two year contract and not make seven appearances and we don't pay Tottenham anything. But, if he gets back in the team and hits the ground running, scores whatever four goals in seven games, he looks like the Deli Ali that you know we seen three or four years ago. Then suddenly every every team in the Prem is going to come and go. Here we go, you can get Deli Ali on a free next summer now. Mm. So you know what I mean. There's loads of well, loads sure. of really... so if if he doesn't so his contract runs out in twelve months. Does that mean then that that stipulation for Tottenham is that over then? It's over, yeah, yeah, yeah. The minute that he's not an Everton player, those 20, 20 appearances are for Everton. So he's got to have made 20 appearances. I'm saying, for so, so, so he, he can sign another for Everton, and this, even when he plays those seven more games, regardless whether it's on his contract or another contract, he has to, you have to, you have to put on him. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it doesn't. That's it. It's If he makes seven more appearances for Everton at any point, then we've got to pay Tottenham 20 million. And I don't so think that, that makes it. No, but, but but I also think they've almost got a budget for that, haven't they? Is is go look? We can't afford to not buy him the twenty million if he is that player. Do you know what I'm saying? If he's yeah. that old Ali Ali, it's a snip at twenty million. Yeah, that is it. That is it's And it, and it's also a conundrum for him, isn't it? Because you know, if he's if he's going to be true to his word and say, look, I owe Everton a lot, and he stood by me and blah blah blah, you'd like to think that he goes, you know what? If Everton get me back fit fit again and get me love and footy, then I'm more than happy to sign a contract with them. But mm. if he's if you know if we're going to be 
cynical about it. He might go, well, why was I signed for Everton? Why would I not just run my contract down and, and sign for another team? And in that case, he doesn't make seven appearances. And he really, that's just so, I think it's so concerning. Yeah. It's, it's complicated, but really interesting because if he doesn't make those seven appearances, what club's going to want to sign him? You, you would ask decent, mm-hmm. you're better than us. You know, you, you know there's, there's, there's at least 10 clubs in the Premier League that are probably, you know, in the balance of the position they're in and, and the, you know, the squad they've got and the manager who are probably more attractive proposition to the, than Everton, at least 10. But he's going to have to make seven appearances for Everton and look like the old Deli Alley in those seven appearances to attract those teams. And I don't think yeah. we'll let him play seven games if he hasn't signed a contract. So it's it's just it's mad. And then on the on the more important side of his uh, mental health, obviously he's done the interview with uh, Gary Neville on the Obola. and um, just goes to show you the kind of money and the fame and everything that you think that wow you would you know love to have. It's not always dropping in a happy, wouldn't you? So yeah, for not going through the trauma he's yeah for the trauma he's went through as a young uh, as a young boy. Um, it's horrendous. I mean, anyone go and watch it, Gary, Neville, Gary Neville's overlap. Um, talk about, you know, getting abused when he was a child, you know, selling on drugs, basically just being left. Basically, it sounds like um, what I thought was mad about it when how he's became a footballer. Do you know what I mean? It's like he's gone through all of that and yet he still managed to be a footballer. It just shows incredible. Um, he must have had just, just an incredible natural talent um, and, and a mindset when it comes to putting his boots on and getting on the pitch because, um, to go through all that and, and still make it, it's, it's absolutely incredible. He's had no stability in his life whatsoever up until he was adopted. Um, and it sounds like it's just been a ticking time bomb, to be honest, you know, all that stuff he's went through. And then at one point in his career, it, it's all come out. And yeah, fair play to him for being so strong and so on about it. It must have done a hell of a lot. Yeah, and how often do footballers say, that, or, or athletes in general, that, that that's, that's their escape, isn't it? I mean, generally, you know, whether it's, you know, from a positive perspective or whether it's just, again, to cope, a, a lot of athletes say that, you know, when they step out on that pitch or out in that arena, that, you know, they're a different person, they're allowed to be a different person, that they're, they're the football and not the person. And I think for, you know, what, yeah. what come across really strong in, in the case of Telly Alley is that the minute that he lost that and he lost that crutch of football or lost mm-hmm. that crutch of being the athlete and not the person, he had to become the person again, and that's when it all, you know, become too much for him. But yeah, even though listen, do you, know, yeah. do you know what was really sad though? Because just just say we we obviously touched on the media before. What I found really like heartbreaking is his comments at the start of it, where he said, "I'll be honest, as only I'm ready to talk about this right now." But the media have basically said to my people that they're gonna re- they're gonna leak it, they're gonna release it. So I wanted to get ahead of it and talk about it, and that that just broke me hard. That. It's like the lad's not even ready. Scumbag, you know. It's actually absolute scum of the earth, honestly. And it, it honestly, and I think that was the bit that, that Gary Neville thought when he told him what it was that he, he, you know he was going to be released by the media. I thought, who, what kinds of disgust and moral compass have you got as an editor to go? I don't care. I, I want that to come out, and I want to sell papers, or I want to get a million clicks off that to to expose yeah. someone's life. And 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 drive them further into that hole. He could listen. So fucked up. Yeah, it, it wouldn't have been beyond belief that he was took his own life after that coming out in the in the, yeah. the press without him being able to, you know, communicate to himself. So he's so strong for doing that. Um, and and you know what I can uh, of it. Yeah, no, nowhere near to the extreme as, as what he's what he's had to go through. But I remember for me. After I got injured in Afghan, and I uh, am completely fine talking about it now, but I didn't for a long time. I didn't tell anyone that I lost the ability to have kids, you know, and all that. And to me, it was a big thing. And I remember when I was ready, and I opened up and spoke about it in my book. It felt like a huge weight of the world had been lifted on my shoulders as as I'd owned it. Now, just trying to com- kind of compare it to what he's went through, I can't imagine anyone saying, "Hey, I know about your injury. I'm about to put this in the paper tomorrow." It is fucking would have broke me. Do you know what I mean? That people are threatening to yeah. give my something that I'm I've got to live with, I've got to kind of own, but I'm not ready to yet. And yet someone's saying yeah. it, oh, yeah, it's going out. Oh, I I can't even imagine it, do you know what I mean? So um I made up that he got the chance to own it, but like you say, it's sad that it wasn't on his terms of when he wanted to own it, do you know what I mean? 
yeah, it's oh, yeah. No, I, I I can't begin to understand what it's like, but yeah, and and listen, credit credit to to Gary Neville and his team as well for stepping up and, and doing it the right way, and and um, I thought it was a very well produced piece. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Um, all this stuff I, is at the moment. That overlap's been great. I've really enjoyed it, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I I didn't see that one coming. I mean, I, you know, I. I've been led to believe there was a lot of stuff in the in the background. Um, and look, people won't know this, but we spoke about it, didn't we, briefly on last time? We took it out. We were making yeah. comments about, you know, de- de- is Delhi Ali overweight? What's going on? Speculating on the reasons why it was. And, and literally the day after we'd recorded that, that kind of, fortunately, we didn't put it out. It was a look distasteful at the time. And that's what we said. Yeah. It was all about It's one of them. If anyone would have watched it, it without that coming out, they probably would have agreed with us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is we were just saying what you kind of from the outside looking in, what you think, you know, is Delhi Ali still the player he is? What's going on? Mm. And then obviously that comes out, so we, uh, yeah, I think correctly took it out. But, but yeah, um, made on just some of the signings. Well, seeing that United Rashford has been um, given his new deal, nice five year new deal for him. Big, big. If you believe the numbers, like it's a nice big, um, a nice big payback that he's got. Um, Maguire has been told he's not the captain anymore. Um, and that comes at the same time as Bruno Fernandez has turned down and moved to Saudi. So you'd like to think that, you know, Bruno is going to be captain. Thought he had it quite well, Maguire, do you know what I mean? Thought it was, um, is the tweet was, the, yeah, the tweet was classy, wasn't it? Um, yeah. And, and, and listen, I think, um, I think he realizes, doesn't he? I mean, he'd be the first to acknowledge his performances of the last. 12 to 18 months, if not longer, of, of not being up to the standards United would have expected or he would have wanted. Um, there's obviously a bit more to that. There's obviously been a lot of turnover, managers, players. The goalie yeah. has not, not been at his best as well. But no, I, I think, um, yeah, I, th- I, I agree. He didn't get handled it well, yeah. Mate, on um, Stick Away Footy, last couple of uh, stories on, on, on the old football was uh, Harry Kane. I asked you last week, well, Harry Kane's the best Spurs player. He is at the moment, but the news that's coming out of Bayern Munich, quite cryptic, I thought, that some of the Bayern people are saying, if Harry sticks to his word, he'll be a Bayern player in no time. Which were, I they was... it, were they talking about it? Were they talking about Harry or were they talking about Lee, Daniel Levy? I, I That was the bit I oh. couldn't understand. Is it definitely Harry Kane? I thought it was Harry Kane, yeah. They've been speaking to Harry's dad, I think, and his brother, who's his agent. And they were basically saying, look, if, you know, if Harry, you know, sticks to what he said he wants, then... He'll be at Bayern next year. So um I thought, yeah. And I seen um Jamie O'Hara coming out on Talk Sports saying that if Harry does leave, it'll be a little bit like when Berbatov left. And it was, you know, they Tottenham kind of fell off fell off a cliff for a couple of years after that. And I think it would be really, really tough for Tottenham if he does go. And um, the more this is kind of going on and on, I think he will. I think you know what yeah, I mean? doesn't kind of come out and kind of say, look, I am not going to pen the new deal or whatever. I think the longer this yeah. goes on, the longer it is, he'll probably end up at buying it. Maybe Daniel Levy scrambling around to get a replacement for him or something, or just to hold out for that extra few quid. I don't know, but I think as the weeks drag on, I, I can see him ending up in buying. Yeah, I know. I know. Apparently, Daniel Levy said it's a hundred million. That's what he wants. That which, which, listen, I think it's a fair price for Harry Kane, if I'm honest. But as you're, you're alluding to there, the longer it drags on, the more of a vulnerable position Tottenham are in. I mean, if that's the case, that Harry Kane said. To his people, and, and probably to Zander Levy, maybe to Andy Costa Cobb, we'll say, Look, I want this move this summer. I want it to happen. There, yeah, but it's probably going to happen. I think it's in Tottenham's interest to try and come to that resolution as quickly as possible. Yeah, because if Harry King is <laughs> in Ireland, say, Look, well, you know what? Okay, if you're not going to sell me now, I'm just going to not sign a contract and I'll go for not next year. And then that's where it's a bit of blackmail comes in and it's almost like, Yeah. Do you know what I'd be pushing for if I was Daniel Levy is saying, Okay, well, we're maybe not going to get the hundred million. We want a buyback option, you know, for under these terms. And I don't think Harry Kane, as we were alluding to, really on the keep you against that either. Yeah, no, I think he, deep down he's a Tottenham player. However, he also acknowledges at this stage of his career, I think the the time for him to start winning trophies and to yeah. start competing every year in the Champions League, you know, come what may. So maybe the the compromise there is, if Harry Kane is coming back to the Premier League, we get first option to buy him. Yeah. And it's, you know, that's, and I think that, you know, from a Tottenham fan perspective, you'd probably be pleased with that again because you're thinking he's not going to go to buy him for a year and then come back as a City player or, or Chelsea or whatever. Yeah. 
Um, hey, the few last little ones on foot you thought were interesting is um, the the women's football game. Uh, I thought you were going to mention Hannah Zingley then. Yeah, for oh, yeah. She's on yeah, here as well, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, okay, we'll start with her then. So, yeah. I didn't even realise Big Dunk had left his position in Forest Green. Um, yeah. Forest Green have got a little little place in my heart. I'd done a motivational talk for them just prior to them getting promoted for the first time for the Football League. So, I always have a look to see how they're getting on. Um, didn't even know Big Dunk had left because I thought it was mad. I mean, he, he basically got the job when they were already on the yeah. way down to getting relegated. You know, it, it was an impossible task for him to you know, get them out of the relegation zone. He, he, you know, didn't do that, which, again, pretty standard. I thought his job was already planning for the next season. And, yeah, I look around and he's he's left, so... Yeah, I, th- I think there's... I don't know, but I don't know the ins and outs. Um, you can't imagine Dunk to be um, the type of person who is reserved in his opinion of what the club needs or what his needs are for the job. Put, you know put that alongside Dale Vince's personality of, of literally knowing exactly what he wants all the time and being very steadfast with his opinions. He recently brought in a director of football. I don't know if that, you know, that was the the icing on the cake almost. It was like, listen, I'm bringing in this director of football. That's why he wants at my club and I'm facing going, well, listen, I, they maybe maybe then maybe then two messed the new director of football and face and they didn't get on. I don't know, but I, I listened to a few forums. Um when the, the Hannah Dingley news had broke a few weeks ago, most Forest Green fans were saying we weren't surprised about the Hannah Dingley caretaker appointment, but we were surprised about Ferguson leaving because it was like mm-hmm. it came out of nowhere. So I don't think we're the only ones to be either, in your case, not aware of it or shocked. Yeah. Um, so the, the story with the Hannah Dingley was it's been labelled a PR stunt. Um, so they basically hired, obviously, a woman, um, which is a big deal in that sense. Southampton B team head coach David Horseman as he's now being appointed um, as their new manager. So she, you know, she's had what? I'm not, three weeks. Yeah. Three um, weeks. So it does sound a little bit like a PR stunt, to be fair. Um, yeah, I mean, that what, says I, I, I almost, I almost, I almost think that's a sexist opinion by thinking it's a PR stunt. Why would you? It's like no, well, just, just bear with, just, just bear with me. She was the academy manager. Like in any in any instance, if you your manager leaves all of a sudden and it's left behind, the obvious candidate ninety nine percent of the time would be the, the academy manager just to step in for periods or the under eighteens or twenty ones. Someone at the very top of the academy would normally go, right, I'll take over for a few weeks to tell you this out what you're gonna do. So mm. I think even intimating that it's a PR stunt is yeah, you know what sexist comments out of them all to say Yeah. Okay. I, w- I will backtrack slightly then, knowing that she's come from the ac- academy. I thought this was just, let's get a woman in for two weeks type thing. It would be akin of just saying, let's get Steven Gerrard in for two weeks type thing. That's a kind of be asked. And so, fair enough, if she's come from if she's from, come from the academy, then yeah, giving well reason. And yeah, I can see why it's it's the, it's the right step. Um, Yeah, the headline I was kind of reading, people saying, why is she coming just for two weeks? I mean... You could argue then if she has done the academy job well, why is she not being given a bit more of a fair, fair crack of the whip then? You know, two weeks is you know. Oh no, yeah, I, I, I think it was a you know it was a it was a huge move from them. Look, I'm not I'm not going to say it wasn't, despite the fact that she was a academy manager and she had that that profile. I'm just just trying to make sure I'm just clarifying that she was definitely a academy. I know she was the most qualified person at the club at that time. If that's the case then. And then yeah, fair enough. Do you know what I mean? If that's the case. Um, but now Southampton B team head coach is um, he's now being appointed uh, with the task of getting them out of league too. Um, I mean, it it, it just says I'm, I'm just looking at a wiki and stuff, and I haven't got into every single thing. It just says she was at she's been at the academy at Forest Green since since 2019. Um, she's worked at yeah, she's she done some work at Swansea, worked with you know Jan Mulby and stuff. She you know she has has a bit of a background. I think that I think with her as well, she's got a UH for pro, pro license. There's not, there's actually not many. I'm, I'm saying that, that that fact. There's not many coaches below the championship that have got the pro license mm-hmm. in any team, regardless of you know who it is. So she's a highly qualified person. Um, I, I think it's I think it's disappointing to be honest. I think it's disappointing that she's not been given a crack of it. Whether and it'd be interesting to to hear what the reasons for that for. She might say I didn't want it. 
Yeah. So I stepped up for a few weeks and it wasn't a good fit. I've had, I've had a chat with Dale Vince. We've decided to not go with it. I think that I would have liked to have heard that first. Do you know what I mean? Before, almost before they announced the pairing of boss. Or even from the owners to say this 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 is the rationale. Because it, in a normal instance, you would have found out whether the caretaker boss was interested in the role, wouldn't you? Or what that process was going to be. So it, I think it'll be interesting to hear a little bit more about it, i.e. whether she applied for it full-time, whether it was just the owner's call, whether it was you know a toss-up between the two, I don't know. Um, and also, I guess, what what's, what's her role now? Does she just drop down to the academy and stay where she is? Yeah. We do the story on women, and there are a few mad little stories this week. Um, do the story on women it was this big kind of arguments over pay, which I think is really interesting. Now, the women's game has got a long way to go in terms of the weekly wage, and especially when it comes to internationals. What I thought was really interesting, though, are the women, women's, some teams are kind of moaning, saying that they're not getting paid enough compared to the men. But when you actually break it down of how much their men's game makes and a percentage of actually what goes to the players, the women are getting a much bigger percentage of the pie than what the men are getting. Mm. So on one hand, you can say, well, we're not getting paid as much. But on the other hand, you're actually getting a bigger percentage of what the what the kind of organi- or organization makes. And I think women, they need to be, I don't want to sound condescending by saying like they need to be careful, but in a business kind of mind, if you're if you're in a business and it's making, I don't know, say, you know, 100 million and you're getting, I don't know, say a, a, a 20%, say, type thing and 20 mil is getting given out to you guys. And then you're saying, well, I want to get paid compared to the men, but the men are only getting kind of a 5%, but they're in a kind of a billion dollar game. It, mm. Do you know what I mean? It's like you can't expect to get what the men are getting if your business isn't making as much money as well. That's it. I, I think that's a good way of looking at it. I, I think if if the business itself, which in this case is you know is, is FIFA or UEFA, I can't remember who it was. Since it's 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 all the, the women's World Cup, essentially, if that's not making as much money as the men's World Cup, how can you have a decent no, like, I say, there's no money to pay. It's not there. That's what I mean. So it's like, yeah. you know, the I agree. I, I think from a percentage point of view, it's the fairest way to do it. And if the women are getting an equal percentage of the revenue that the men are getting, I think that's that's got to be it. And actually getting more. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, you understand the women are saying, you know, we're not getting paid nowhere near as much. No, you're not. But you, what you're doing isn't making as much, though. So it's like... Another way of, like, looking at it, though, the only sports at the moment, and we were talking about this the other day, we made to the weekends, where you've got almost complete parity not only from a, a financial point of view, but almost from a performance point of view and respect for the performance, is like MMA, tennis. And, you, you, you know, beyond that, you're screwing a little bit. You're like, where is the, you know... Even tennis, though, you know, the women don't play, you know, five sets. don't play like, five sets, but what I'm saying is, though, you still get, like, that centre court still full. Yeah. You know, there's still, there's still a lot of attention on it. There's still as many eyes. There's probably equally as many sponsors involved in it. Now, I wouldn't say certainly in the case of this weekend because it, the fact that it was one and two on the men's side and and as you say it was an underdog on the women's side there was a lot of yeah. strange results on the women's side of the draw and there was necessarily the same amount of eyes on that final mm-hmm. compared to the men's one but what I'm saying is like I, I'll, if I switch on the telly I was watching Wimbledon this week I wouldn't have turned off if the women were on I'd be just as interested in watching that match as the men's equally if I'm watching a, a UFC card I'm not saying enough when the, the women's fights come on because they are just as entertaining, if not better at times. I think you've nailed it, Gary, with the two sports where women, for me personally, I can watch and I don't think any another is tennis and MMA. And it's on at the same time. The point I was going to make is that those two competitions on a, on a UFC card, it won't be like, oh, all the women come on first and the men. It's it's like back to back almost. And with tennis, you're like, all right, the, women, the men's final was after the women's final, but... It, the games are going on simultaneously, so the crowds are coming in to watch all of those games. They're not coming in going, I don't want to see the women today, I'm just going to go and see the yeah. men. All the courts are equally full. So I think until you can create that type of environment where people are coming to watch, you know, these are in a few times this season with Premier League games where you could come along and you could watch the ladies. And on it. Yeah, yeah, and you stayed on and watched the men after the night. I think that's an interesting way of doing it because commercially, from a football club's perspective, they're selling out that stadium. The fans are staying there all day. They're buying drinks, food, merchandise, or whatever. I think you could you could certainly get a lot closer to a split from the club's perspective. But from a and competition perspective, until they're playing 
the men's World Cup and the women's World Cup at the same time, you know, which is a logistical nightmare as well. It's going to be yeah. difficult for them to get there from it. I think you may you make a great point though, and it actually weirdly comes into one that the story wanted to talk about. And we didn't plan this, but you make a great point. The sport where men and women coexist, coexist like that is athletics, i.e. the Olympics. You know, you could quite easily watch the, the men's hundred meters and then the women's two hundred meters. It's do you know what I mean? And so on athletics, I don't know if you've seen, but the girl from South Africa, uh, her name is Casta Semenya. She's just won her appeal at the European Court of Human Rights to challenge whether her rights have been infringed by rules requiring women athletes with higher natural testosterone to reduce those levels through medication. So with her point, it's very, you know, muddy, murky waters with the whole transgender movement and things like this. But with hers, it's slightly different. She was actually born um I'll have to try and get the the, like the medical kind of um, definition of it. She's not trigender. She was assigned female at birth, raised as a girl, identifies as a woman. And she's never publicly identified as herself as intersex. However, she essentially acknowledged that having conditions by appealing the DSDS rules that she's basically was born with kind of, I don't know the medical kind of side thing, but she was born with male genitalia. I don't think it was male genitalia, but something like male organs, like male sexual organs. Testosterone. And basically, yeah, yeah. her testosterone is, is, is far higher than your average woman. So it just creates just a whole minefield of, you know, what, almost what you can say, what you can't say, what's allowed, what's not allowed. And anyway, she was told that, you know, what, your testosterone's too high, you need to bring it down. And she said that infringed on her human rights and she's won an appeal. So I just mm-hmm. think it creates, um, it creates a lot of headaches in sports. And, um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, you could say create a precedence, but it, to a certain extent, it could be seen as a positive precedence. If, if the, the fact you've just stated there, and again, I haven't, I haven't looked into all of the, the medical papers here on this and, and to what extent her testosterone like testosterone levels are higher than the other women in the competition competitions, but if she was born, I guess, from a hospital records as a female and she's identified as a female throughout her life, mm. to be told later on to say that actually, no, your levels are a bit higher, you're going to have to you know, medically change the makeup of your body just yeah. to come in line with everyone else. How many athletes down the years have you 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 made the comments or like they're like superhuman? There's loads of like 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 cyclists and stuff where you go there, their white blood cells count are so higher, so much higher than everyone else's. You don't see them getting told you've got a lot with them, do you? Yeah. So, and I, I know it's a different example here where we are, but it's still an example where a certain human, whether it's male or female, is just more physically developed in a certain capacity than another. And so basically, she's an athlete that has XY chromosomes and differences in sexual development. She has a condition known as hyperandrogenism, which is characterized by higher than usual levels of testosterone, a hormone that increases muscle mass and strength and the body's ability to use oxygen. So she's a woman, but just got this. She's got thing. some capabilities that men have got, yeah. And like, yeah. I, and I'm, I'm not saying... Um, uh, listen, I, I, I think, I think you're right in terms of the precedence, and I think they were looking at it going the dangerous precedence this would set if we rule against it is that the level of testing you'd have to do on every single female athlete, like in, you know, in, in football, rugby, you know, basketball, all those sports where like the, the, the physical demands at times they're trying to get closer to men in terms of like trying to get to that level of. You know, intensity, whatever. I, I think that would have been probably been more dangerous than what they've actually done there. Yeah, mate. We've um, there's been so many little mad sports stories. We've uh, got the last five minutes. Mate, we'll finish off. If that's all right with you, unless you've got anything else on a um, big UFC card this weekend. We've got me, Paul Molly, back in the arena. You know, um, just praying, just as a kind of scouts, kind of friendly points that she does well and, and gets back on the get stacking up those W's again because obviously she was on a bit of a roll at the loss yeah. and, and obviously now she's back. Just fingers crossed she can um, put on a performance. Absolutely, yeah. and I, I'm, I'm confident she will. I think it's it's a massive one because it, um, the UFC, it, it's not not like boxing where you know, you'd have a defeat or you'd have two defeats and then you're finished. But it, it seems as though there's a lot of instances certainly over the last 12 months where once you have, once you you're beaten twice, you're almost 
that ends up becoming three defeats, four defeats, five defeats, and then you're gone. You know, you're out of that. You're out of the UFC, and I don't want to see that happen to her. So hopefully she does get the win. Um, and yeah, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good card, don't it? Yeah, it's definitely definitely one to look forward to. Yeah, yeah, no big um, yeah, big good luck to Molly um this weekend. Um, mate, I know you're obviously juggling a work day today. I'm actually down in Cornwall. I'm actually going dolphin watching this afternoon. So um, I'm uh, appreciative of your time, mate, that you're able to give up. Um, and then ask to finish on. No, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Um, enjoy your dolphin watching, mate. Dolphin watching. Yeah, no, it's always a bit of a pain doing it on stream, yeah. But, uh, mate, thanks for your time and thanks everyone who's uh, tuned in again, whether that's on YouTube, iTunes or Spotify. Your support means a lot, as always. Hopefully, we'll be back in the studio next week. And, yeah, have a great weekend. I'll see you soon.